today is the fifth Sunday after Easter. We'll be here again in Benita. In the epistle for this fifth Sunday after Easter, just before Ascension Thursday, this Thursday, and the Rogation days, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, is taken from St. James's Epistle, chapter 1. Dearly beloved, be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only. Deceiving your own selves. For if a man be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he shall be compared to a man beholding of his own countenance in a glass. For he beheld himself and went his way, and presently forgot what manner of man he was. But he that hath looked into the perfect law of liberty and hath, and hath continued therein, not becoming a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. And if any man think himself to be religious, not bridling his tongue, but deceiving his own heart, this man's religion is vain. Religion clean and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and the widows in their tribulations, and to keep oneself unspotted from this world. In the Gospel, taking out of St. John, chapter 16. At that time Jesus said to his disciples, Amen, amen, I say unto you, If you ask the Father anything in my name, he shall give it to you. Hitherto you have not asked anything in my name. Ask, and you shall receive, that your joy may be full. These things I have spoken to you in Proverbs. The hour cometh when I will no more speak to you in Proverbs, but will show you plainly the Father, of the Father. In that day you shall ask in my name, and I say not to you that I will ask the Father for you, for the Father himself loveth you, because you have loved me, and have believed that I came out of God, from God. I come forth from the Father, and am come, come into the world. Again I leave the world and go to the Father. His disciples say to him, Be, Behold, now thou speakest plainly, and speakest no proverb. Now we know that thou knowest all things, and thou art needest not that any man should ask thee, by those who believe that thou camest forth from God. Thus are the words of today's holy God. <coughs> And the Father's only goes to men. Today is the few days before our Lord Jesus Christ arises into heaven on Ascension Thursday. And this is the time of the time of the consideration of prayer. Prayer means lift the mind and heart to God. And we know that this time between today and to Sunday after the fifth Sunday after uh, Easter and Ascension Thursday are the last few days which the Lord Jesus Christ is on the earth. And we see throughout history that whatever a, you ask a man first, by the time he goes to fulfill the request, he may forget. But the thing you ask just before he goes to fulfill requests, this thing he shall remember. So when it comes to the asking of prayers, asking of requests, it's best to be the last one to ask rather than to be the first one to ask. Because then you have much greater likelihood of, being, of having your prayer heard. Hence, we have this custom and consideration in the last few days before ascension. Our Lord Jesus Christ is going to go up into heaven to be at the right hand of the Father. And so on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday of this week, we have the rogation days. which means the asking days. And we are asking specifically for what is needed for our life in this earth. Now, one of the most necessary things for our life in this earth is to be in the state of sanctifying grace. And to have the faith. But we also need health. We also need food. We also need shelter. We also need clothing. We need material things. We need to see that the wheat grows. We need to see that there's going to be a harvest. And we're at the beginning of the springtime of the year, and the harvest is either planted, and it shall bear fruit in the fall, or it is not planted, and it shall not bear fruit in the fall. And so here, to the teaching of man previous to our 20th century, where we know little about anything about farming, there's a recognition that he who wants to have fruit in the fall, and he who wants to survive the winter, he had better do some planting in the spring. And if he doesn't do planting in the spring, he can pray all he wants for the wheat to come. He can pray all he wants for the fruit to be gathered. But this prayer shall not be heard. And the Lord Jesus Christ says in these last few days before he goes into ascension, there are prayers and there are prayers. Remember our Lord said in the gospel, he who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall not 
enter the kingdom of heaven. Made it very clear that those who only pray, that means beg and ask, they shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. In wisdom chapter 7, or chapter 5, we see that the final prayer that to ever be said is going to be the prayer of the damned. There is no prayer in heaven, but there shall be prayer in hell. And the wisdom of chapter 5 speaks of the prayer of the damned. When the damned shall be burning in hell, and they say, We fools, we estimated their life as madness. But behold how now they are in the state of glory, and we are in the state of suffering, and they shall ask to cease to exist. They shall ask for their pain to stop. They shall beg for the misery of hell to end, and that they shall cease to exist, because they hate God, they shall not desire God, but they shall desire to cease to exist, and they shall pray. They shall also desire that their pain be taken from them, and they shall pray. It's what happens in hell, they pray. But their prayer is not accompanied by works. Not only that, but their prayer is, is fully satanic and demonic, because the only one that can answer prayer is God. But they hate God, and yet they still pray and they beg. Our Lord Jesus Christ said, Those who say, Lord, Lord, shall not enter the kingdom of heaven, but those who do the will of my Father. So that there is prayer, those who say, Lord, Lord, and then there is prayer. Remember the good thief when he prayed upon the cross. He said, Remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. But before he said that prayer, what did he do? He had lived a perfectly evil life. On that morning of Good Friday, he cursed Christ just as much as the bad thief. He hated Christ just as much that day as the bad thief did. But something changed inside of the thief while he hung upon the cross. And he, before he could say, remember me, he had to do something beforehand that his prayer might be heard. Because a prayer equals a begging. Prayer is a begging of God or of a benefactor for a benefice, for something that we want, for something that we need. And if you're going to at, want that prayer to be fulfilled or to be heard, we had better do something that will move the heart of the benefactor to hear our prayer. So what did St. Dismas do, who had cursed Christ only minutes before? He has said, this man suffered the, the, we have suffered the just reward of our crimes. He made a distinction between himself and God. There are three men hanging on that cross. There are three men being crucified. Three men dying by the command of Pilate. And three dying the same death. So they must be the same. The Dismas and Gesmas must be the same as Jesus Christ. So Gesmas thinks, and Gesmas also prays, because he says, O Lord Jesus Christ, if thou be the Son of God, prove it. Hear my prayer. Save yourself and save us. Prove your God by coming down from the cross. Prove your God by saving us. He had a specific demand, and that meant he wanted to come off the cross. And why did he want to come off the cross? Bishop Seen says most clearly the real reason why he wanted to come off the cross. And this is the reason why most of us want to come off the cross. We are not much different from Gesmas. He wanted to come off the cross. And why did he want to come off the cross? To continue his life of thievery and murdery and the like. That's why he wanted to come off the cross. He wanted to come off the cross because he didn't like suffering. He didn't realize that suffering came into the world because of sin. And Gesmas was only hanging on that cross because he was a murderer. He was only hanging on that cross because he was a thief. He was only on the cross because he deserved to hang on that cross, but he could care less about his being a murderer. He could care less about his being a thief. He just wanted off the cross without getting rid of the cause of the cross. Hence, his prayer was not heard. And the, and the, and the, and the tradition tells us, those are witnesses of the cross, that birds came and ate out the eyes of Gesmas, so that he was blinded. And in despair, he died of a broken leg. He died at the same time as Dismas died. He prayed at the same time that Dismas prayed. And Gesmas now burns in hell after saying a prayer on his deathbed. 
And the Dismas is now a saint in heaven after saying a prayer on his deathbed. So many pray upon their deathbed. So many as they are dying, they say, Lord, save us. Lord, save me. But why do we want to be saved? St. Alphonse says, this prayer is a sacrilege. And when a man says this prayer, all he does is heap coals of fire upon his own head. And this is the prayer of many Catholics when they die. He was saying these words 300, 400 years ago when everyone was Catholic and everyone went to the Latin Mass and everyone had a traditional anointing and everyone was following the faith. And he said the majority of these souls that pray upon their deathbed, they pray like Gesmos, the wicked thief. They don't pray that they, be, that, that they are to be taken away from sin, but only to be taken away from suffering, only for a time that they might continue in sin. That's the reality of the prayer of the majority of souls. If only I had my health back, I could go back to being a criminal. If only my health back, I could go back to impurity. If only my health back, I could go back to thievery, robbery, pride, and all of my, my glory in the world. I want to be of this world, and therefore I want my health back. I want God to hear my prayers, that he might go back to my life of sin. What is the value? And what is the reason for God to hear such prayers? If he does hear the prayer, what happens? All that happens is those whose prayer he answered receive a greater degree of fire in hell, a greater degree of eternal suffering, and a greater degree of despair. What is the point of hearing such a prayer? It is of no benefit to those that pray in this manner. We are in the final days of prayer before Christ's ascension. In the final days of prayer before the judgment of Christ comes upon our world and the chastisement that's about to hit us. Final days of prayer before the victory of the Blessed Virgin Mary. But what does a victory mean? Victory means one man kills another. One man takes another's stuff. One man takes another's possessions, and the one who's defeated loses his life, loses his possessions, loses his health. That's the one that is defeated. The one that has victory takes those things and spoils. The victory of the Blessed Virgin Mary and the victory of our Lord Jesus Christ means someone's going to lose. Someone's going to lose what they have. They're going to lose what they love. They're going to lose their life. Now, if we are on the side of the Blessed Virgin Mary, we are look forward to this victory. But if we are not on the side of her, and we are not on the side of heaven, we dread this victory. And the great question is, in what side do I stand? And the one of the greatest litmus tests is prayer. Because the saints tell us, whoever prays shall not be damned. And yet Christ said, Whoever prays and says, Lord, Lord, shall be damned. And so what does this mean? Those who pray with the words of empty, with empty words, these are not praying. They are not begging of God. They are simply liars, saying their final lie before they go to the father of lies, who shall be their judge and their ruler for all eternity. They're just the final lies that many souls say before they pass to damnation. But what is prayer? Prayer is to beg of God what we really need and what we really want. When you really want something, you pray for it. And if you don't want it, you ask for it, hoping that it may not ever show up. What do we really want? What do we really beg for? Hence the Lord Jesus Christ says in the Gospel, Hitherto, in Holy Thursday night, he tells the apostles, you have not prayed in my name. But now I want you to pray in my name. Hitherto you have not asked anything in my name. Ask and you shall receive that your joy may be full. You're going to ask and your joy may be full. What is the joy of the Catholic? What is the joy of one who loves God? <clears throat> when we pray, <clears throat> do we pray for things that give us joy in this world? or pray for things that prepare us for the kingdom of heaven. We pray for something to give joy to the heart, something to fill the soul, something to fill us with faith, or to fill, to fill us with the treasures of God, or for the things of this world. We're all afraid of the coming doom that's upon us. Our economy is about to collapse. 
Our lives are about to get very difficult, it seems, very soon. But what are we wanting? Do we want our lives and our comfort back? Or do we want Christ to be the ruler of our country? Do we want Christ to be the ruler of souls? Do you want many souls as possible to be saved? And we know that without a certain amount of suffering, souls do not return back to God. And if they don't receive any chastisement, they will most of them be damned. So what is it that we desire? Our Lord Jesus Christ said, If you love me, if you really love me, when you hear about the, all the troubles happening in the world, wars and rumors of wars and earthquakes and persecutions, you will lift up your head and be joyful, Lift up your head and rejoice, because your redemption is at nigh. Your redemption is at hand. It is nigh. So our redemption is at hand. And remember, our redemption shall also be a human redemption. It shall not only be a redemption of our souls and our spirit. It shall be a redemption also of our bodies. Many, many times the saints were attacked by the enemies of God, and they tried to kill their bodies. But God would not allow it. Only when it was time for the saint to become a martyr would he be allowed to be killed. But well, before that time, the Lord said, And men and men, I say unto you, they shall not harm a hair of your head. But if it is not time for us to be tracked by the GPS devices, they won't find us. If it is not time for us to be arrested, we won't be arrested. If it is not time for us to die, we won't die. But when the time comes, we shall not escape it, nor should we ever want to escape it, because it shall be the entrance into glory. What do we desire? We desire God. We desire the possession of God. Consider Good Friday. The holy apostles were cowards, and they ran away. But what were they doing while Christ was hanging on the cross? They were weeping in their hearts. They were begging for him to return. And they wanted the real Jesus Christ to return as he is, as God, as true God and true man. And they begged for him to return. And they couldn't bear him being away from them. They didn't even believe in resurrection. They thought it was impossible that he rise. But they could desire nothing else but to be with him. They could desire nothing else but to see him restored in glory. And then he could not suffer ever again. That's what was in their hearts on Good Friday. And they wept, and they were hidden in the crowd, but their prayer rose to God. Just like it says in the book of Tobias, that when Sarah wept, and when Tobias wept, because Tobias' wife turned on him, and he was abandoned, and Sarah's only last faithful servant turned on her, and she was abandoned, and they were alone, completely isolated from the entire world, and they wept on the same day. Tobias did not know Sarah, and Sarah did not know in any way Tobias, and they were very far from one another. But on the same night, they wept before God, and they were tears of true sorrow and tears of true abandonment, and they wanted comfort. They did not want just the comfort of heaven, but they wanted comfort of God even in this life. And their tears went up to heaven, and they were both given comfort in this life. Sarah was given the most wonderful husband. Tobias was given the most wonderful daughter-in-law. And Tobias' blindness was taken away. And all their joy was brought back to them. And then they went to heaven. But this victory of their prayer happened in this life. And not in the next. And consider this about prayer. If we consider what prayer is really for, it's only for this life. The saints in heaven, they can never ask to get a higher place. They can never ask to receive more glory. They are in the absolute perfection of their happiness, which cannot be added to and cannot be subtracted from. And they have God. Therefore, they cannot ask for anything more than they have. And they do not ask for anything more. And they cannot achieve anything more because they have God. Asking is only for this life. Hence, we learn in the communion of the saints that the saints in heaven, when they speak to God, they pray. They do not pray for themselves. They pray for us. Prayer is only for us, and prayer is only for this life. Even when you pray for your grandpa that died many years ago, or a child that died many years ago, even if they died outside the church, you pray for them. What are you praying for? You're praying that they receive the grace of repentance before they die. You're praying that they respond to the grace of God before they die. You're praying that they responded and received a greater place in heaven, 
or were taken away from hell and received a place in heaven, even if they had to pass through purgatory. Prayer is only for this life, not for the next. Hence, we find in prayer that there is not only a supernatural, spiritual side for the glory of heaven. There is a natural, physical side. For instance, those that are very wise, St. Mary Magdalene de Pazzi was one of them. She was exceedingly wise. And she realized that this life is to get a higher place in heaven. And the only way to get a higher place in heaven is to bear the cross. And therefore, she prayed daily, out pati, out mari, out pati, out mari. That was her prayer. Either to suffer or to die. Either to suffer or to die. She wanted to suffer as much as possible because she wanted the maximum glory in heaven. That is proper selfishness. She wanted to suffer that she might have the greater view of God, that she might be closer to God forever. And she knew that suffering made her closer to God. So whenever she suffered, she was so happy. And whenever suffering diminished, she was not happy. The St. Thomas would tell us she never desired pain. She never desired suffering. She desired glory. And she desired seeing God face to face and she desired being closer and closer to him, and she knew that suffering was the way. Just like a man that really loves the prince, that really loves his princess, he wants to go through all the obstacles, every conceivable obstacle to prove his love for his princess. He wants to suffer so much so that the whole world can see, and she can see the depth of his love, what he's willing to suffer to get her. And this is the way that St. Mary Magdalene de Pazzi prayed. Let me suffer in this life, that I might know love. And also, Blessed Margaret of Castello tried to teach a young girl what prayer she should be really be praying. She met another girl like unto herself, a girl that was hunchbacked, a girl that was blind, a girl that was suffering. Mar Margaret of Castello never saw the light of day. She was blind all her life. But she saw God, and she saw the angels, and she levitated every day, and she was filled with such joy and happiness in her hunched back and in her pain that she knew happiness in this life that none of us will ever know. And now she's even happier in heaven. But she told another girl who she found, that I was also born blind. You were also born blind? You were also sick and weak like me? Then let me tell you, if you really want to be happy, do not ask to see. Because if your eyes are open to this world, you will see sin. How many sins have I seen in my life? I have never seen one. Therefore, I have most blessed eyes. I have never wanted to see with my eyes in this world because my eyes will always be perfect and I shall see heaven. And I shall see Jesus Christ in absolute wonder and perfection. I desire to remain blind. And if you really want to be happy, don't ask to see, but ask to remain blind. And the girl thought about it for a short time. She said, you know what? I thought about it, but I don't want to be able to see. So in sorrow, Blessed Margaret cured her blindness. And we don't even know, remember the name of that girl. She would have been a great saint. But for a few years, she saw the colors of this world. And then she died. But Margaret, who died 800 years ago, sees God face to face and sees all colors in a beautiful way that even though her eyes are restored, as our eyes shall also be restored. When she looks at the colors of the world, she will see so much more beautiful color that is beyond our ability to see. She has such a more wonderful view. Now, what is prayer? Prayer is to ask for what I really want, for what I really desire. That's what our Lord Jesus Christ said when he said, when you ask for something, ask for import with importunity. Don't stop asking because they said no. Don't stop asking because it's a difficulty, such as the man in the middle of the night who said, don't, I will bring you bread in the morning, but don't bother me until then. And you don't stop bothering him. He shall rise and he shall give you bread, not because he likes you, but because of your importunity. And this is how we must pray. Now, this prayer requires action. It requires movement in our heart. Hence, in the case of Dismas, what did he do? He said, we suffer the just reward of our crimes. We are on a cross as Jesus Christ is on a cross, but we are not on the same cross. We were not scourged, and he was scourged. We are not crowned with thorns, and he was crowned with thorns. And we are not the reason of death. 
It's because they hate Jesus Christ that all three of us must die. The only reason there is death in the world is because we hated God. If there was no hatred of God, there will be no death for men. Do you not know that I would not die, St. Dismas, and you would not die, Gesmas, if we did not hate Jesus Christ? If there was no hatred of him, there would be no death. And the reason there is death is because of our sins. So he made a distinction between himself and God. And this is the foundation of prayer, which is called humility. The recognition of the truth that I am deserving of nothing and God is deserving of all. And then he continues in his prayer. Remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. Now once Jesus, once Dismas has expressed his heart, once he has made the distinction between himself and God, once he has recognized the worthiness with which he dies, and yet Christ is not worthy of death, then whatever he asks, Christ shall hear. He's going to hear. So many words and so many prayers are made by so many souls, and they are not heard. And the real reason is because we don't desire what God desires. And what we really desire, we don't say honestly before God. The wicked one desired, Dismas, I want to continue my life of sin. I want to continue my life of mediocrity. I want to go back to the old days. That's what I really want. But they can't say that out loud because he's supposed to be a Jew, because he's supposed to be a Catholic, because he's supposed to be a good one. So he says, save yourself and save us. This is all a lie. He could care less if Jesus Christ is saved from the cross. He only wants to be saved from the cross. If suppose that this was taken down from the cross, would he have tried to save our Lord? Would he have tried to say to St. Dismas? Gesmas would not. He would have run away. He was a liar. And this last prayer was a lie. Let us make sure that our prayers are not lies, but they truly come from the inner heart. We want this chastisement to come. We want the victory of Mary to come. We want the world to become fully Catholic. We want souls to return to God. We want the errors and heresies of Vatican II to be eradicated and wiped out. We want happiness in our hearts. We want to be saved from the wickedness that the, or the world is putting down upon us. We want those that are being persecuted and those that are being murdered, such as by these vaccines, and those being murdered by the wicked rules of our modern governments, and those suffering greatly by the wicked rules of our governments throughout the entire world, making one world order. We want this suffering of the innocent and the widows and the orphans to be taken away. We want Christ to rule inside of hearts, but do we want that? Do we want these things, or are they simply lies that proceed from our mouth? Hence, our Lord Jesus Christ says, when you pray, pray with importunity. But if you only pray, if you only say words, if you only say, Lord, Lord, you shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. Hence, religion pure and undefiled, as it says in the epistle today, is this, to visit the widow and the orphans, to take care to visit the imprisoned, to show that your prayer, that what you want to be done to yourself, what you want to happen to yourself, because you really desire it, you want it also for others. We want alms given to us by God. If we really want alms given by God, then let us give them away. As one day St. Maximilian Colby complained to God, to the Blessed Virgin Mary, I need help. I need money because I need to be able to continue building these printing presses and try to spread the faith. And she said, but don't you still have some? I don't have enough. And the Blessed Virgin Mary said to her, have you ever eaten lunch? Have you ever eaten dinner? He said, yes, I have. Well, what do you do? You empty the plate. And when the plate is empty, then the mother puts more food on the plate. Empty the plate and I will fill it. The plate still has food on it. Eat it. And so he gave away all his things. And these were the economics of Maximilian Colby. And they're the economics of the saints. Very hard economics for us modern souls. But they are the economics of the saints. We give all away what God has given to us so that he can give more. And the fact is, he will give more. Let us learn that which prayer really is. And then let our prayer be made to God. Let the petition be made to God. As the wise man said to St. Augustine as he was dying, Augustine, there are many people asking you for miracles. And you are performing miracles. I am dying. Can you save me from death? And Augustine <laughs> said, if I could save you from death, wouldn't I save me? He said, don't change the subject. You just make me healed right now because I know you're dying and you have to do it before you die, so get busy right now. He said, okay, I'm sorry. And then he cured him. He didn't get an argument with Augustine. 
He pegged and he pegged. So it must be with us. Another man was speaking to another saint in the Middle Ages. And he came to be a monk. And God had him had a vision, that saint, not a, I forget the name of the saint, he was a lesser saint in the Middle Ages. And he said, you, you I've seen, God showed me that you are in hell. He showed me you will be damned. And I have no man who's damned working for me. Get away. And he said, well, at least say that I will not be damned. You are going to be damned. You are going to be damned. You are going to be damned. He said, I make sure I'm not damned. I'm not damned. I'm not damned. I'm not damned. He wouldn't leave. <coughs> and finally, the guardian angel of the saint came down and said, tell the man, leave me alone. God changed his mind. He won't be damned. And he changed his mind again. By the way, he can still be a monk. So take him in as a monk. And so the man was not damned, though God said he would be damned. And he was not. He became a monk. And remember the wise king of Nineveh, Jonas, the prophet of God, who of all the prophets stands through Jesus Christ in the most special way, because Jonas was three days in the belly of the whale. He preached most violently, and he said, this city shall be destroyed. And he preached violence as Christ preaches violence. He said, you shall be damned if you don't love me. You shall be damned because of your sins. You shall all be damned. And that is what Jonas preached for three days. And what happened? The king of Nineveh said, we will put sackcloth and ashes upon us. And not only all the men and children, but the beasts shall be all made to fast. And the whole city fasted. Not only men, but also the beasts. And then God changed his mind. And he did not condemn Nineveh. So it is with us. We are in a world that is deserving of great condemnation. In our own individual lives, in our family lives, in our city lives, in our church life, in our whole world's life, we are deserved of the greatest of condemnations. And yet, our Lord, if he hears us say, Lord, save us, Lord, save me, and Lord, save me, Lord, save me, and the leper that lays up his voice, and who told him to shut up? The, the, the apostles told him to be silent. The friends of Christ told him to be silent, but he cried out with a louder voice, and so the Lord saved him. And don't forget about the woman who touched his garment. And Christ was being beaten about by everyone. And a little woman touched only his garment, the hem of his garment. And he said, who touched me? And he was frustrated. And though there were thousands touching him, she knew exactly who he was talking about. Because when you pray, even if there's a large crowd around you that want to see Christ, and there's a large crowd that wants blessings from him, when he says, who touched me, we know to whom he speaks. If we really pray with our hearts, therefore he said, Lord, it was I. And then he cured her. And also St. Augustine, St. St. Gregory Great tells us, he was on his way to perform his fifth miracle, which was the raising the daughter of Jairus, or fourth miracle. But the schedule was changed because a woman changed the schedule. Because she wanted to be cured the daughter of Iris is dead. I know it's very touching. It's very important, but I've got the dropsy. And I need it to be fixed right now. And I've only touched him with his garment. I'm going to be saved. He's going to do something he thinks is important, like raising someone from the dead. But I've got the dropsy, for heaven's sakes. I need it to be cured. Does he cure the most important things? St. Anthony, the patron of lost things, he taught detachment and detachment and detachment and detachment. But he had one book he used to carry with him everywhere he went. And it was a book that had the bravery, had, there was no bravery at the time, but it had scripture in it. It had writings of early fathers before him. He lived in the, in the 11, 1200s. And it, we used it for preparation for his sermons and meditation. <coughs> and the book was taken, the devil realized how attached he was to that book. So he got a wolf to steal the book in the middle of the night. And then Anthony wept and he said, Lord, I really like that book. I want that book back. So much for detachment. And what happened? God became angry and spoke to the wolf. Wouldn't allow him to eat or destroy or damage the book. And he had to bring it back to Anthony. And hence he's a patron of lost things. I'm not supposed to be attached to books. Or St. Blaise, the reason why we have candles, because of St. Blaise and a woman who was attached to a pig. And he, she used to sleep with a pig. And one day the wolf took away the pig. And she was so upset that but she lost the pig. She went to Blaze and Blaze, bring back my pig. And Blaze could say no to no one. Therefore, the pig was brought back. Others asked to be taken off the cross, but they were not taken down. 
Others asked for everything to be given back to them, and it was not given back. But Anthony asked for a book. The Lord, the old widow lady asked for a pig, maybe reminded her of her husband. But the fact is that he, she liked to sleep with a pig, and the pig was brought back. God will bring back small things and great if we really desire. And furthermore, as St. Augustine tells us, what do we desire? I want you to have joy that your joy may be full. We want those things that God gives us from him and for him. That's what we want. We want what he wants. We have a similar heart to his. And therefore, when we ask for anything, we cannot say no. Let there be true prayer inside of our hearts and not empty words of liars. And the only one that can teach us how to pray is a mother. The Blessed Virgin Mary is so important in everything, but the mother sees through words. The mother is not impressed by words, but the mother sees the heart. And the mother sees the inside. And the mother also knows when the inside is wrong and the heart is messed up, she knows how to fix it. She knows how to clean it and purify it. So let's ask the Blessed Virgin Mary to teach us how to clean and fix our prayers so that when our Lord goes up into heaven and when the time comes for us to near, be near unto our judgment, we will pray with a prayer that shall be heard. We bless you all. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.